as well. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Walker. Um, Stephanie is um, the Extension Vegetable Specialist and an Associate Professor at uh, New Mexico State University. Um, she's a co-director of the Chili Institute or the Chili Pepper Institute um, and the chair of their annual um, Chili Conference. Um, her research focuses on trialing and identifying uh, vegetable cultivars and production practices um, and um, involved in uh, chili pepper cultivar breeding work as well. And uh, Stephanie is going to talk to us about the, the chili pepper industry in uh, New Mexico. And uh, hopefully from that, we can kind of understand how that might become something that you could also put on your farm here. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Stephanie. Okay, thank you, Dan, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this conference and uh, talk about uh, New Mexico's iconic chili pepper industry. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how they came to New Mexico and uh, what uh, New Mexico growers. Let's see. There we go. Uh, so first of all, just a quick introduction of chili peppers. Uh, it's fairly common knowledge that they're a member of the nightshade family, so they're very closely related to tomatoes, eggplants, and potatoes. Uh, for chili peppers, they're under the, the genus Capsicum. Uh, there are five different domesticated species around the world, uh, but by far and away, uh, the most popular uh, species that's grown, uh, particularly here in the United States, is uh, Capsicum annuum. And this does include bell peppers, uh, paprika, cayenne, and jalapenos that are all in the same genus and species as New Mexico chili peppers. Uh, but of course, I'm talking today about the New Mexico type, uh, green and red. So chili peppers actually originated in South America to Central America. And as a wild uh, plant, uh, they, they have very, very small fruit. And initially, you know, birds would eat these red fruit they detach from the plants very easily. Uh, birds would fly some distance. Then the seeds were not damaged in the uh, digestive tract of the birds. In fact, uh, the uh, digestive tract of the birds actually helped with germination of the seeds. The seeds would be dropped with some good startup manure right there. And uh, initially, of course, that's how chili peppers spread from their, re their center of origin. Uh, wild chili peppers have these uh, very small red fruits. They're also called bird peppers. And birds don't feel the pungency. So, you know, the hot chili peppers don't bother birds at all. Uh, it does appear that the pungency was developed to uh, dissuade uh, ma uh, mammals uh, from basically feeding on the chili peppers. Uh, obviously, this may work on a lot of mammals, but it didn't work on human beings because human beings quickly decided that they really like this pungency. <laughs> and so, they uh, basically fell in love with chili peppers uh, very early on. So uh, we still have the wild chiltepine peppers. Uh, they're also called chili piquin. And from uh, this original mother type uh, chili pepper, all the other uh, pod shapes, varieties that we see today were developed. So the chiltepines are very small fruit, a very high heat, about 50,000 to 100,000 Scoville heat units. And as I mentioned, you know, in nature, the birds will, will eat these peppers and then go deposit the seed elsewhere. And we do still have some wild chiltepine that can be found uh, in very warm areas of the country, uh, including Southern Arizona and Southern Texas. Of course, the uh, Native Americans, they discovered chili peppers, you know, after initially harvesting wild peppers uh, to supplement their diets. Uh, they were often used for medicinal purposes uh, as chili peppers still are today. Uh, but as humans started getting in there and selecting for larger fruit uh, with a stronger attachment force, because they didn't want those red fruit to drop off the plant. They wanted them on there so they could harvest them. Uh, as the fruit became bigger, they developed a pendant shape where the fruits start pointing down. And of course, uh, it takes a really big bird to grab one of these big peppers and fly off. So the seeds were no longer dispersed by birds. So chili peppers became uh, dependent on human beings to uh, distribute the seed, which uh, obviously human beings have done an excellent job of. 
So the story of uh, Christopher Columbus's misnaming of chili peppers is pretty famous, uh, but here I'll go over it again here quickly. Uh, New Year's Day, 1493 was Discovery Day when Christopher Columbus first discovered chili peppers. Of course, uh, he was in search of black pepper and when he discovered this spicy, uh, pungent red pepper, he thought it was related to black pepper, which absolutely is not related to chili peppers. It's a different genus and species. But of course, uh, he was also a great marketer. So he was gonna really tout this amazing discovery that he made. So he wrote, the pepper which the local Indians used as a spice is more abundant and more valuable than black pepper. So there he was gonna make sure that everyone really recognized him for his uh, amazing find. Uh, after Christopher Columbus did discover chili peppers, uh, they moved quickly throughout Europe and Asia. So. Many, many communities, many countries really embraced chili peppers early on. And we know now that it's really an integral part of the cuisine of Asian countries, India, uh, other, uh, other areas of the world. And many of, the, many of these countries just can't even imagine that chili peppers weren't always there, that they actually came from the new world. Now in New Mexico, when I talk about chili peppers, I'm referring to peppers that have heat, uh, pungency. So there are other states that have a uh, greater production of bell peppers, but for pungent chili peppers, New Mexico is the largest producer in the United States. Uh, there are other countries that are much greater producers, but uh, this is kind of a point of pride for New Mexico. Uh, on occasion, California has actually produced more hot peppers than us, but they, they never, they don't hang on to that crown very long. Uh, New Mexico usually retakes it quickly. And of course, here in New Mexico, chili peppers are intertwined with the cultural and historical heritage of the state. Uh, chili peppers were proclaimed the state vegetable of New Mexico in 1965. And we have the very famous official state question, red or green? And when someone asks red or green, uh, that indicates what type of chili pepper do you want with your meal, red or green? And of course, many people will say Christmas. So if you ask for Christmas, that means you want both red and green on your dish. So chili peppers actually have deep historical roots to this part of the country. Uh, they've been cultivated in the territory that's now New Mexico for hundreds of years. And according to Spanish written records, when the Spanish colonists first came into this part of the world, uh, they basically took credit for introducing chili peppers to this region. Now, this is still a point of great debate. Uh, many Native American communities do feel like chili peppers was traded up and down the Rio Grande corridor before the Spanish came but the Spanish came and they're the ones that actually wrote this down. So since we don't have any archeological evidence uh, disputing that, uh, we tend to think that, yeah, the Spanish brought these chili pepper seeds up to the New Mexico territory. Uh, this first introduction may have been during Antonio Espejo's expedition in 1582 through 83. And a, a member of that expedition, Baltasar Obregon said they have no chili, but the natives were given some seed to plant. And in 1601, when uh, Francisco de Valverde uh, wrote his records, he indicated there was no chili peppers currently amongst the crops being grown by the Native Americans. So we have the New Mexico acequia system. Uh, this is a system of uh, earth line canals that was uh, implemented by the Spanish colonists and maintained also by many Native American communities. And actually having this ready source of surface irrigation allowed increased crop production, uh, particularly in Northern New Mexico. And so this really helped to establish chili peppers as one of the crops grown in Northern New Mexico. You know, certainly here in New Mexico, we don't get enough of precipitation to support vegetable crops. Uh, but once we have these acequia water, uh, watering systems, chili pepper was supported. And these acequias actually continue to serve farming communities today uh, with recent drought pressure. Uh, a lot of these are greatly endangered. And so certainly that's a, a topic for another day, but of great concern. But after chili peppers were established uh, throughout New Mexico, we had the development of the New Mexico land race chilies. So if you're ever at the Santa Fe farmer's market or you know, perusing sales around New Mexico, you may see chili being sold as native chili. So when it says native chili, that indicates a New Mexico land race. 
And uh, these New Mexico oh. land raised chilies are known for excellent flavor, you know, high quality. People really seek out uh, this particular type of chili. Uh, the fruit tend to be shorter than the uh, traditional New Mexico type. They usually have medium to very hot pungency, uh, quite variable heat level too. Uh, one amazing thing that we have seen in the New Mex land races is because of the way they were selected for a relatively short growing season in northern New Mexico, they're very well adapted to a quick germination, quick fruit set, work really well for a shorter growing season. And many communities throughout New Mexico uh, have their own particular chili peppers or families or communities. Uh, one of the most famous is Chimayo. So you may or may not be familiar with Chimayo chili. And actually there's several different types of Chimayo depending on which family farm uh, you purchase your chili from. Now, having said all this, the New Mexico land race chilies are genetically distinct and very different than the New Mexico type chili that I'm focusing on today. So the New Mexico type chili uh, actually has its origins uh, with Fabian Garcia. Uh, Fabian Garcia is a gentleman who we're very proud of. He was actually in the first graduating class of the New Mexico School of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts, which is now New Mexico State University, my, my employer. And uh, he uh, had seen the different land races uh, growing in the community and realized that they were too va uh, variable, too pungent to really be of wide interest to a, a large group of consumers. So through selective traditional breeding, uh, he developed a standardized, uh, more uh, predictable heat level, New Mexico number no. nine. So New Mexico number no. nine was the first New Mexico type chili variety. Now, uh, New Mexico type versus Anaheim. Uh, so it's one of my, my uh, peeves, I guess, when I hear New Mexico chili being referred to as Anaheim chili. Boy, it bugs me. I see this in seed catalogs. I see it everywhere all the time. Anaheim chili actually has its genetic roots in Fabian Garcia's work and his genetics. So when Fabian Garcia was actually doing his selection work, uh, he was visited by a gentleman named Gilberto Ortega, who was just fascinated. Look at these great chili lines you've got going. So he took seed with him back to California, the Anaheim area, and there he developed his own long green type chilies uh, that are known as the Anaheim. So I always contend that uh, Anaheim chili should be called, yeah, like New Mexico chili, as opposed to the opposite. But of course, Anaheim chili does have a different heat profile. They tend to be milder. And uh, yeah, I guess I always say, yeah, they took the chili seed back to California and made it more wimpy. <laughs> so perhaps that's why people still clamor for New Mexico grown, New Mexico type chili. Now, New Mexico type chili is also often called hatch chili. And there is no hatch chili per se. A hatch chili really is any of these long green New Mexico pod types that are grown in the hatch region. And as with the acequias up north, uh, the hatch chili uh, really took, had its start with water. So the Elephant Butte Dam uh, was completed in 1916. Before that time, farmland below hot springs, that's now known as truth or consequences, was subject to flooding. You know, farmers would get washed out, a lot of problems. So once this dam was able to more control the flow of the Rio Grande, a farming below it really boomed, and that included the Hatch Valley and surrounding areas. So Hatch Chili fame really had its uh, start with uh, Joseph Franzoy. He was a new uh, immigrant to the area and the father of commercial scale Hatch Chili. And he began farming uh, in the Hatch Valley in 1918. And he was looking for different crops that could possibly you know, do well for him, that would bring a good profit to his farm. And it's said that when he first tasted a chili pepper, uh, he thought he'd been poisoned. He was horrified, <laughs> but of course he quickly warmed up to these pungent pods. And today, uh, Franzoy's descendants, along with other prominent commercial producers, continue to produce and market excellent red and green chili. And some of Franzoy's ancestors did organize the first Hatch Chili Festival. Uh, that was the first one occurred in 1971. And since then, uh, every year, if you want to come to the Hatch Chili Festival, it always takes place over Labor Day weekend. Uh, last year during the pandemic was the first year since 1971 they didn't have it. And I'm happy to say they did have it again this past uh, season. 
So early cannering operations uh, were inspired, inspired the development of New Mexico number no. nine. So Bobby and Garcia needed, knew we needed a more standardized pod that would work for, for canning and preserving the crop. And in the meantime, New Mexico number no. nine's released increased the chili processing industry in the area. So once we were able to take these New Mexico chili peppers and preserve them, this allowed for distant shipping and an introduction of chili products from New Mexico worldwide. Uh, Valley Canning and Mountain Pass Canning back in 1917 were some of the first canners of uh, New Mexico type chili, and they actually introduced the old El Paso brand name. Now farmers scaled up to meet demands of these canning operations, and uh, we of course had the breeding program at New Mexico State University that would also support this industry. Uh, one prominent breeder, so we've had chili breeders at New Mexico State University ever since Bobby and Garcia's time. So it's a really point, point of pride that we've had this nonstop breeding program for us uh, so very long. So Roy Nakayama uh, was the chili breeder from 1950 to 1984, and he also was uh, looking to improve uh, the quality characteristics of New Mexico type chili. And he actually had a working relationship with the Lytle family, which is one of those hatched chili growing families that's still very active today. And in collaboration with the Lytles, uh, Nakayama released Big Jim. So Big Jim is still one of the most popular green chilies for fresh market. Uh, Roy Nakayama also released other New Mexico type chili cultivars, including uh, Española Improved and Roy Na Arnaki, which was named after his wife, Rose. So here's a picture of some of our beautiful Big Jim. Uh, New Mexico 6-4 is another uh, very popular uh, variety of New Mexico type chili that's still grown, but the fruit size were smaller. Uh, big, uh, New Mexico 6-4 has about six and a half to seven inch uh, pods. Uh, big Jim is much bigger. And what had happened with the Lytles is years of families saving their own seed without the necessary isolation to prevent a cross-pollination events from occurring, caused us some changes to the New Mexico 6-4. So the Lytles that were consistently breeding with, uh, with controlled pollination, controlled seed saving uh, to develop the very large fruited Big Jim. And this was awarded the uh, world record holder for the largest chili fruit uh, at the time of its release. Uh, Espanol Improved was another one of Nakayama's releases, uh, Nakayama and Frank Mata in 1984. And this actually uh, was developed by Crossing Sandia, which is a very popular hot New Mexico fruit type with one of those New Mexico land races that, as I mentioned, has very, very early maturity. So Espanol Improved is still a very popular variety, uh, particularly in northern New Mexico with a shorter growing season. So this is a great choice possibly for Utah where it uh, matures quicker. It does have a good, uh, good fruit size, a New Mexico type fruit size, and it does have excellent yield flavor. Uh, the heat is hot, fairly hot, uh, not overly hot maybe, but 1500 to 2000 Scoville heat units. Paul Boslin uh, was a, a chili breeder who retired from New Mexico University uh, back in 2018. And he's actually the uh, individual who founded the Chili Pepper Institute. So the Chili Pepper Institute was developed basically as kind of the, the holder of uh, all chili research, chili information. And we actually now have a Chili Pepper Institute online store. So if you want to purchase seed of a wide variety of New Mexico pod types, as well as chili pepper varieties from around the world, you can actually purchase seed uh, from the Chili Pepper Institute online store. Uh, Paul Boslin did also continue to work to develop uh, better chili pepper cultivars, and he released some very popular ones, including New Mex Joe Parker and New Mex Sandia Select, which uh, has the heat level of Sandia, but has a thicker fruit, so it's a, a higher yielding Sandia type of pepper. Uh, if you want to join us uh, during the summer here in Las Cruces, New Mexico, every year we have a Chili Pepper Institute teaching garden where we grow plots of hundreds of different chili pepper varieties uh, from New Mexico and from around the world that you can come walk through, take a look at. Uh, it's a, a very a fun experience to go through that garden and it's open to the public. So let's talk a little bit more about New Mexico type chili now. So New Mexico type chili is valued for its heat, 
Uh, the heat comes from capsaicin chemicals that are produced in members of the, of the capsicum genus. And no other uh, plant family produces these capsaicin chemicals. Uh, but also New Mexico chili peppers are valued for their pigments. Uh, in particular, they uh, produce a couple of uh, fairly unique uh, red pigment. So capsanthin is that bright brick red pigment. Capsarubin is a deep uh, reddish brown pigment. So chili heat is uh, the heat that we get from chili peppers. Uh, comes from capsaicin and other closely related chemicals. Uh, these are alkaline oily chemicals uh, that are mainly produced on the vesicles or the veins of a chili pepper. So many people incorrectly believe that the seed is the hottest part of a chili pepper. And that's not really true. The seed doesn't contain any capsaicins at all, but of course the seeds are right there on the placenta. So they may have some capsaicin on their surface. Uh, chili heat is reported in Scoville heat units. And this was actually based on a panel a tasting, a cereal tasting panel by, by trained human testers that was developed in the early 1900s by Wilbur Scoville. Uh, currently, though, we use the high performance liquid chromatography to actually measure the parts per million of each type of capsaicin, and then we convert this into Scoville heat units. And uh, just um, as growers, you probably already know this if you grow hot peppers, but a capsaicin or the heat level of chili peppers does increase in fruit if the fruit are being set during a stressful time for the plant. So the stress may be drought stress, uh, heat light intensity, but uh, stresses will make your fruit hotter. And I'm often asked, well, how do I stress my plants just enough to get it a little bit hotter? And I say, I, I don't have any formula for that. <laughs> so I wish we could uh, control our heat level that well, but uh, heat level can be quite variable in some of these varieties, especially the open pollinated types of which all the New Mexico types are open pollinated varieties. So chili color, we actually have a uh, processing plant here uh, right outside of Las Cruces that actually extracts the red pigments from red chili pepper. And then it's actually sold as a natural red food coloring. So you'll see it marketed as oleoresin paprika. You know, back when it was discovered that uh, artificial red food coloring was ca uh, cancer causing, uh, everyone was looking for natural red coloring and paprika chili was a great source of this. So uh, currently, if you, if you have a, a food product that says natural red food coloring on it, uh, very likely you have paprika from New Mexico in that product. So the uh, color is measured in ASTA units. Uh, ASTA unit stands for the American Spice Trade Association, basically uh, the measurement of overall pigments in that chili pepper. With New Mexico chili, as I mentioned, our state question is red or green. Well, you know, we all know we're all farmers here or plant enthusiasts. The red chili is the physiological mature stage of green chili. So, you know, really you get red and green fruit on the same plants, right? <laughs> and uh, prior to the 1980s, most, most New Mexico type chili varieties were dual purpose. So they'd be harvested for green, then the growers would let the remaining fruit stay in those plants, turn red, and they'd harvest for red. Well, as we, as we improve varieties, uh, particularly for green, and develop thicker meated, uh, more fleshy green types, uh, these new varieties no longer work for red dehydration. Instead of drying down beautifully on the plant, they would tend to rot. Not good for the red industry, of course. So about that time in the mid 1980s, the New Mexico chili industry really split into green and red camps where we have new chili varieties that are either bred for superior green qualities uh, such as very thick fleshed or superior red applications. So for our red chili industry in New Mexico, the vast majority of this crop is dried down and dehydrated. Uh, it's either used for that oleoresin paprika, uh, the pigment extraction I mentioned, or most of the, most of the crop actually goes to powders and flakes. Uh, the larger processors here in New Mexico do develop and grow their own proprietary cultivars, so the public uh, at large can't really purchase the seed. Uh, some of the main uh, characteristics that are really valued by the red chili industry include high extractable pigment, uh, ease of drying, you know, the less energy to, to dry those fruit, the better, 
and very low heat level because if we're growing these peppers for color, you don't necessarily want that uh, heat level coming in. So throughout most of the world, historically in New Mexico, chili fruit were dried on ristras, on ditch banks, uh, on, on roofs. But of course, the increased production and phytosanitary, phytosanitary challenges uh, uh, propel the adoption of commercial dryers in New Mexico. So currently we have either tunnel dryers or continuous belt dryers. And uh, most of our red chili crop in New Mexico is mechanically harvested. Uh, this was something that really transitioned in the 1980s. And for the most part, uh, machines with inclined double helix picking heads are used. And so you know, these, these fruit can take some damage. They're just gonna be dried and ground. So it works well for red chili. Uh, green chili, on the other hand, uh, is a different story. So our green chili in New Mexico is harvested when the fruit are fully sized, but physiologically immature. So the seed and green chili fruit is not really viable yet. Uh, the green chili is processed as it's steam peeled because of course with New Mexico green chili, that thick cuticle on the outside needs to be removed before you eat the fruit. Uh, we have industries that freeze or can it, but a direct market sales also continue to increase here in New Mexico. So many growers uh, will actually harvest their crop, either uh, peel it, freeze it, and send it off, or send it off uh, fresh for, for roasting elsewhere. And of course, uh, the green chili industry in New Mexico is still mostly hand harvested. So current challenges, why we haven't been able to mechanize, the, the fruit are difficult to orient, they don't roll, roll, roll well, uh, the fruit can be easily damaged by some machines, and removal of the, the stem or the pedestal uh, is important for the processing industry, but it's proven to be mechanically very difficult to do. Uh, we have been researching mechanization of green chili here for quite a long time, and last year I'm very pleased to say it was the first year we actually did have some commercial mechanical harvest of green chili. In 2021, we did release a new green chili variety that has proven to be more efficient for mechanical harvest systems. That's New Mex Odyssey. And uh, here's a picture of it here on the bottom. And you can see uh, we actually, through selective breeding, this is an open pollinated cultivar once again, but we have a higher fruit set with a strong single stem, you know, supporting those fruit off of the ground so that the harvesters can come underneath very efficiently and the fruit come off the plant a little bit easier. So they're dislodged by the machine uh, pretty readily. And my last slide here, so future, present and future. So of course, we're still fighting the labor thing here. We know that we have a very high quality crop that's uh, recognized throughout the country and world. In 2012, uh, the New Mexico Chile Labeling Act was established that's enforced by the Department of Agriculture in the state. And basically this just says that if you are advertising chili as being grown in New Mexico, you have to prove that it was being grown in New Mexico. <laughs> so, okay, so with that, I left a few minutes for questions here. Uh, this is my contact information and i uh, free to take any questions if there are, are any. Well, thank you, Stephanie. That was exciting to hear, you know, just the historic background to it and, and where the industry is moving and that type of stuff. Um, question from Anna says, is the chili pigment only used in food applications or can it be used for other purposes like for fiber, maybe for art? um some of that type of stuff you know, oh yeah you... i'm sure yeah i'm sure uh you know there is is talk even though cosmetic companies keep their secrets tight to their chest i mean there is indication that's used in cosmetics so it could certainly be used in art uh, other i don't know about fabric dyeing and all that i never never tried it or heard of anyone trying it but it's uh you know it's very uh you know bright red persistent um color so maybe Maybe. Okay. Well, that, that's always good to know. So um, sounds like there's lots of pot potentials there. Um, someone else asked earlier, I think you, you addressed it, but maybe I missed it. You know, the spelling of chili is always something that <laughs> you know, yeah. gets me. So, I mean, you guys spell it with an E and some people yeah. spell it with an I. So, you know, 
what gives? <laughs> yeah, I guess, boy, there's been a lot of debate over that. Yeah, other countries, you see C-H-I-L-L-I-E and uh, everything in between. Uh, just we in New Mexico, the Chili Pepper Institute has taken the stance that we're going with the Spanish spelling, which is the E, C-H-I-L-E. Although I will say that some of the processing companies and farms here in New Mexico actually have their their operations spelled C-H-I-L-I. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So, so yeah, so we, so we may never resolve that one at all, but that's I okay. Think, I think that's about right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, basically, do what you want and go from there. So, are green chilies ever dried? Yes. Yeah. There's a small, uh, small segment of the uh, dehydration industry that will dry green. Uh, of course, it's a lot harder to dry green chili. So a green chili powder really uh, commands a premium price. Uh, so yes, it's, it's just not, it's pretty small though compared to the red chili drying. Okay, good. Um, and then another collect question from Alexis says, I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat where physiologically the heat comes from in the chili? Sure, yeah. So it's uh, the capsaicin chemicals are actually produced in vesicles on the veins. So yeah, it's one thing we always say is, uh, you know, if you have an undamaged green chili fruit and you just bite off the tip where the veins don't quite uh, reach, you'll get a good taste of the flavor without the heat. Then you give the next bite to your friend to find out how hot that pot is. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's the veins and vesicles. As long as the fruit's undamaged, that's where the capsaicin chemicals are, are gonna remain. So the, ve the veins essentially are the the parts where the seeds are attached to and things like that. So yes, as you yes. move farther up the chili fruit toward the stem, it's going to get progressively hotter. Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, let me see if there's any more. I think that kind of hits all the questions that we have. And some, someone asked about, um, is there ways to force chilies to mature to red more quickly? <laughs> and and could you I I could you say something about that? <laughs> yeah, well certainly. Well certainly, you know, keeping keeping them extra warm, you know, maybe uh, you know, doing techniques to uh keep them warmer, like growing them in a hoop house or something. Uh I will say um some growers will apply uh ethyl, ethylene compounds to to speed up the ripeness. We've really found that unless the chili plants are about ready to turn over to red anyway, it's not that effective. And actually with some of our varieties are very sensitive to ethylene compounds, it will just drop the fruit on the ground. So, yeah. so that's been dabbled in over the years. It hasn't proven to be particularly effective though. Yeah, that I, I was gonna concur with that, that I've had a, growers that have talked about tomato and things like that wanting to color them and they know that when they're picked mature green, you can get color forming. And, but if you don't get your dosages right, um, it can create all kinds of disasters for you. You drop blossoms, you late fruit that you maybe are expecting are gone then and all of those kinds of things. And so um, that, <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. It, it, it's not something that I would recommend, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, had a, we had a variety released a few years back of a new paprika type that we're very proud of and the grower applied ethyl. Uh, we went back a couple of days later and the ground was just red <laughs> and the plants were bare. It was quite horrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've seen that happen too often when people did it because they were just, you know, they got their dosage wrong or something and it, and it really kind of um, made for a little bit of a problem. So 